This is the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria, session number six. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me for another session of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. I can't believe we're at session six already. I'm looking forward to sharing a great conversation that I had with today's guest, Dr. DJ Moran. Uh, In this discussion, I give him the impossible task of providing an overview of acceptance and commitment therapy in one podcast episode, and he truly delivers. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. If you're on the Behavioral Observations Podcast mailing list, you saw an informal poll that I sent out last week. In that email, I asked subscribers to share their preferences on the topic for the next show. And the respondents unanimously chose to hear about one of my favorite topics in behavior analysis, and that is, of course, acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT as it's called. And on a side note, if you're not on the mailing list and wish to get an occasional email from me, head on over to behavioralobservations.com and click the big red button on the right sidebar. Um, Getting back to the task at hand, however, uh, DJ Moran has been a student and practitioner of ACT for over 20 years. Uh, A clinical psychologist by training, DJ has played multiple roles over the years from supporting children and parents with autism to providing deck direct therapy in mental health settings, and more recently using the ACT model to help corporations improve their safety and leadership initiatives. Uh, He's also a fellow podcaster to boot. He's the host of a podcast about ACT-related topics called Functionally Speaking. While DJ is the author of many peer-reviewed articles and chapters, listeners to the podcast will do well to check out his book, Building Safety Commitment, which provides one of the most accessible blueprints of the ACT model I've seen. Even though the book was written for the behavioral safety uh, community, any behavior analyst could really read that book and apply it to the setting in which they practice. Uh, In other words, these concepts are fairly universal, and I was making all sorts of connections to homes and schools and, uh, you know, more uh, traditional applied settings. So, uh, again, if you get a chance to check out that book, uh, I think you will uh, not be disappointed. It's called Building Safety Commitment. Uh, Getting back to this show uh, more generally, um, in this podcast, DJ tells us how we discovered ACT and goes on to describe the core features and concepts of the model and discusses how ACT can help support caregivers of individuals with uh, autism spectrum disorders. Before getting into far to this uh, episode, I have to confess a couple of things. Um, This was the first interview for the podcast I conducted, and I was quite nervous before hitting the big red record button, I have to say. Uh, And during our discussion, I had a couple of uh, random external uh, things happen that kind of really challenged my attention, uh, if you will. Um, I was already having some sound problems with my microphone, so I was kind of fiddling with the settings during the uh, conversation. And then I think we got like a UPS delivery or something like that. And so during one section, if you listen real closely, you might even hear my dog barking at the front door as a package was being (laughs) placed on my porch. And so I mentioned this not necessarily to manage your expectations, but rather point out the irony that, uh, you know, for a topic that stresses uh, being present and accepting and all those things, uh, I was the furthest thing from that. I had kind of a, uh, a lot of private events going through my head, and it was uh, fu- it's funny now. And again, that's the primary reason I'm mentioning it, but it was, uh, was uh, kind of nerve-wracking at the time. Uh, here's the good news, though. Um, DJ really delivered. He brought the goods uh, on this episode and uh, delivered a real, uh, you know, kind of compelling, like I said, overview or primer on ACT concepts. So uh, don't really worry about my shortcomings because DJ more than makes up for it. Uh, so uh, you're in for a treat here. Before we get to DJ's interview, I do want to let you know that this podcast is sponsored by bside21.org. Uh, bside21.org is an ABA news provider that talks about our practice using non-technical, accessible language. 
And I think that the articles are really helpful to read because it models good dissemination practices because it really focuses on talking about behavior analysis concepts in clear, everyday language. And when we're um, trying to explain to non-technical people or lay people what we do, it's really helpful to have that uh, second verbal repertoire uh, you know, uh, at the ready. So uh, again, it's bside21.org. If you want to hear more about uh, how bside21.org was uh, started and the uh, underlying concepts behind it, uh, you can check out session number five of the Payroll Observations podcast. In that op- episode, I interviewed Dr. Todd Ward, who is uh, president of Bside 21 Media. So uh, for more information uh, about the articles and things like that, uh, again, it's uh, bside21.org. So without any further ado, uh, please enjoy this uh, really fun conversation that I had with DJ Moran. Hey, DJ. Uh, Thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? Hey, Matt. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, the pleasure is mine. I know you got a million things going on, so I really appreciate taking the time out of your day to do this. Happy to um, do it. <laughs> terrific. Well, uh, I've got a couple of different objectives here uh, in our discussion. Um, I want to obviously talk about um, uh, the ACT model, certainly. And um, um, I know you've got uh, so many years of uh, being an ACT practitioner that you've got a wealth of knowledge to share with everyone. Um, but before we do that, I want to ask a couple of kind of get to know you questions uh, so we can kind of... Uh, inform the listeners of the you know perspective that you've um, uh, brought here today. So um, before we get going into the you know um, meat and potatoes of the uh, ACT model, uh, one of the things I've, I'd like to ask people is uh, you know kind of what got you into behavior analysis or psychology and things like that? Uh, can you take a minute and just kind of uh, give us a little bit of background? I got into behavior analysis in a fairly crooked way. I went into Hofstra University's clinical and school psychology program back in 91. It was a PhD program. And for the first year, I was being taught all about cognitive behavioral therapy and especially rational emotive behavior therapy, Albert Ellis's material. And I got interested in it. I, I, I wanted to be able to do something as a professional in order to help people. But at the end of the first year, I took a class called learning with my friend now, but my professor back then and supervisor, Dr. Richard O'Brien. And Rich, early, early behavior analyst, like he was in ABBA, or as we say these days, (laughs) ABAI. Right. I can't Uh, get used to doing that. Right. Me neither. Right. Exactly. Um, He was, he's been going to, to, um, Abba for for years, and he got me into behavior analysis because he was very critical of typical mainstream CBT. I mean, just the idea that, you know, we have to change our thoughts in order to change how we feel doesn't sit well with a lot of old school traditional behavior analysts. And I just liked his approach. He, He was going after mainstream ideas. So I jumped into becoming more of a behavior analyst and reading tons of Skinner and all the followers. It, since then, I mean, I've I've become a little bit more aware, thanks to what we'll probably talk a little bit more about, is this idea of relational frame theory, that you can take a natural science approach to dealing with human behavior and still incorporate ideas about thinking and language into that behavior analytic approach. So when it all came together for me was when I learned more about acceptance commitment therapy, functional contextualism, Um, relational frame theory, all of those complex ideas that are going to be able to help us predict and influence human behavior. When I was learning that in graduate school, I said, this this is the world for me. I want to be a functional contextualist. I want to be a behavior analyst. And it all started back in the early 90s with my friend, Richard O'Brien, and also my supervisor, Kurt Salzinger. Uh, Kurt uh, became my dissertation supervisor in mid '90s. I learned a ton from him. He was just a real hardcore, dyed in the wool, totally dedicated behavior analyst. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I wanted to have that kind of foundation if I was going to move forward with more complex behavior. Uh, analytic uh, professional opportunities. Um, so, if f- folks aren't familiar with uh, Kurt or Rich, um, 
Rich wrote probably the first organizational behavior management book, the first behavior analysis for organizations book. And Kurt Salzinger, he's written a ton on behavior analysis. And he was the president of ABBA just about three years ago. Um, so that's my lineage. Oh, nice. Um, and so you have this background where you, you know, came into contact with some, uh, uh, as you say, hardcore behavior um, uh, thinking folks, um, and then took that into a PhD uh, clinical program, right? Right. And and so um, what what helped you, or what were the circumstances that um, uh, allowed you to come into contact with the acceptance and commitment model and the the practitioners uh, uh, of it? It is a really uh, interesting, just out of nowhere coincidence. We had. Bob Kohlenberg, who developed with his wife, Mavis Sai, he developed functional analytic psychotherapy, or some people call it FAP. Mm -hmm. He came to Hofstra in, my, in the early 90s, and he asked if we wanted to make a presentation at ABBA with him. I think it was 94, the ABBA 94 in, in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, went down there, and we were just going to talk about uh, Skinner's viewpoint on the development of self. What does self mean? And so I was a 24-year-old kid trying to figure out, oh, my gosh, I have to give a presentation on the self from a radical behavioral point of view. What? <laughs> well, yeah, right. Exactly. I got myself into a lot of trouble with that one. Uh, but at that conference in 1994, I was, I was just at another talk, and Robin Walser and Steve Hayes were both on the panel. And what they were saying was just very interesting to me. Um, I was going to do my dissertation on obsessive compulsive disorder, and they were doing a case conceptualization of someone with OCD. And afterwards, I got talking to Robin, and we became fast friends, and uh, she invited me out to a workshop in 95 up at Lake Tahoe. Um, and just the community was so small that it was easy to fit into, even if I was from far away, you know, uh, like I, I felt like I was already belonging to something, even though that something was kind of unique in the ABBA world. We had our special interest group, the, um, clinical behavior analysis, special interest group. We had our meetings like at, at 7 AM on the Monday of ABBA, you uh -huh. know, like it, we, we oh, were yeah. not front and center. There was no acceptance commitment therapy books out yet, you know? So it was kind of like a, it was looked at as an unconventional idea, but the people were really dedicated and they're interested in doing something complex and meaningful. Um, so those those situations, those experiences really shaped my career and, and my viewpoint on what we could do with this science called behavior analysis. Wow. Um, sounds like uh, you kind of were in the right place at the right time. I just hooked my wagon. Uh, sorry, I hooked my, my cart to the big wagon. I mean, Steve Hayes and Kelly Wilson, Kirk Strohs, all they really took off. I mean, Steve Hayes was in Time magazine like, I don't know, three, five years ago. I can't remember. And at, at one point, there was no big deal of, of what acceptance commitment therapy was. There was probably 20 of us mm -hmm. in the world that would say, oh, I do acceptance commitment therapy. Now, there's thousands of people. There's over 7,000 members of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Sciences worldwide. And that's essentially the ACT RFT group. Mm -hmm. um, that's, uh, you know, I, I went to a talk by uh, Mark Dixon and he was talking about ACT and he said, the, and I can't quote the actual numbers, but he said the growth rate of, of uh, ACBS is out of control. Uh, right. in terms of how many people are adopting it. And the people who are adopting ACT um, are coming from uh, very different walks of life in the helping professions, uh, if you will. You know, so a lot of people are, you know, kind of classically trained, if you will, uh, MSWs, licensed clinical mental health counselors, et cetera. And they're just looking for really functional stuff to do. Um, is, is that consistent with your experience? Absolutely. I, I recently was elected president of the ACBS, so I got to know a little bit more of the demographics, and it was just so surprising that there are folks who were interested in functional contextualism and ACT, and they're physical therapists, dentists, <laughs> accountants, and it's just like, oh my gosh. I mean, my wife's a physical therapist. I talk to her all the time about acceptance commitment therapy, and she gets it, and she you know, has adopted an approach to her physical therapy, but I didn't know I didn't know somebody else besides my wife who's 
being bombarded with my ideas all the time would be able to absorb it. But there are physical therapists who come to our uh, conferences and um, psychiatrists, um, social workers, as you mentioned, um, teachers, educators, people who are interested in uh, social change, really seeming to take uh, take this functional contextualism idea um, which is just basically 21st century behavior analysis in short. I mean, obviously it's a lot more than that. It's a whole philosophy, but it's 21st century behavior analysis is what I would say what functional contextualism is. If, if any of the listeners are consider yourself a behavior analyst and you want to read some cutting edge behavior analysis, Google functional protection, functional contextualism, check out the works of Steve Hayes and um, Robin Walser and the folks who are doing the, uh, the the work in relational frame theory like Dermot Barnes Holmes and Yvonne Barnes Holmes and Louise McHugh. There's a lot of really great literature that's pushing the edges of what behavior analysis traditionally was and now it is something grand, something fantastic. And I hope people get excited about that. There's more to do in behavior analysis than what was done in the 80s and the 90s and prior. You know, Skinner's ideas, fantastic. And we took that baton and kept running. I see. Well, um, that's, uh, that's, that's real uh, inspiring. Um, one of the questions I had, in the, you know, uh, can we um, maybe spend a minute and talk about maybe some well, I'm going to actually throw this to you since you, you know, your job is to talk about ACT. Um, so um, one of the things I'm thinking of, you know, you, you mentioned the, the, the term functional contextualism and, um, you know, sometimes in uh, behavior analysis, when people are learning in their intro, uh, you know, to ABA course, you know, you go over, you know, okay, what is behaviorism? What is behavior modification? What is applied behavior analysis? I'm wondering if it would be helpful to do some... Um, uh, some of those definition type things with, you know, I, I guess my question is what is functional, what is your definition of functional connect contextualism? And, and I, I suppose before you answer that question, it, it, you know, it might be a good time to kind of segue into kind of, or it, or could that be used to segue into a, uh, you know, kind of an overview of the act process? Right. So I'll leave it up to you in terms of how to <laughs> happily, I'll to happily do it, it. Oh, with the caveat that we're, we're talking about, a philosophy of science and that you just can't learn a philosophy of science by listening to a podcast. Absolutely. So that's what functional contextualism. It's a, it's a philosophy of science that basically has a lot of the same assumptions from traditional behavior analysis. We care about context. We just don't look at behavior. The funny thing is we call it behavior analysis and you don't even just analyze behavior. I mean, the funny thing is we actually analyze context more than anything else. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking oh, yeah. like a behavior analyst, some of the terms, if you were just to do an intraverbal test, um, Bill Verplank, uh, old friend of mine, did some publications with him. He was the chair at Indiana University with J.R. Cantor and B.F. Skinner. Bill Verplank taught me a lot about introverbals and how people understand things, how what knowledge is. If you were to ask behavior analysts to describe some of the introverbals around what behavior analysis is, people are going to say stuff like reinforcement, punishment, schedules, extinction. Guess what? None of those things are behavior. Mm -hmm. Those are things that we focus on an awful lot. I mean, if you pick up any learning text in the first few chapters, you're going to hear about positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, punishment, et cetera, et cetera. None of those things are behaviors. They're things that influence behaviors, but we still call it behavior analysis. Actually, we're analyzing context. But if you're having any doubts of what I just got done saying, I'll also admit that that's even a little bit short-sighted. What we really do in behavior analysis is we look at environment behavior relationships. That's what functional contextualism is all about. How do we look at the context of what's going on around behavior, the antecedents, the consequences? Those are the contexts. And how does the behavior function in that context? What is the behavior a function of? What's going on given the antecedents, given the history of certain consequences that makes the behavior function a certain way. It's not as esoteric as one might think 
at first glance. When you hear, I study functional contextualism, you get a little scared off. That's mm -hmm. why I'm just simply saying right now, it's 21st century behavior analysis. It's mm -hmm. bringing in the ideas of relational frame theory and complex human behavior analysis into a science, a codified science that we can use for not only research, but applications to reduce suffering and improve quality of living. And that right there is like almost the motto of acceptance commitment therapy, reduce suffering and improve quality of living. Mm -hmm. what, what we're doing in acceptance and commitment therapy is we're taking empirically based principles and we're trying to build up a repertoire that we would call psychological flexibility, helping people become more psychologically or behaviorally flexible. I'll come back come back to what that is. But acceptance commitment therapy uses empirically supported principles to increase folks' psychological flexibility. And it does it by using mindfulness concepts and behavior change strategies. Mm -hmm. So that's ACT in, in a nutshell. Okay. I, I've, you know, um, as we were talking prior to um, me hitting the record button, you know, I, 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 I to paraphrase what I was saying, I, I, I haven't studied uh, ACT um, in too much detail, but I know enough of the terms to be dangerous, I, I suppose. You know? <laughs> right, right. Uh, and, and so um, I, I sometimes have described it as the, you know, the kind of uh, combination interaction between behaviorism and, and, and mindfulness. So I'm happy right. to hear that yeah. I wasn't too far off base. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, when we're talking about it succinctly, then yes, behavior analysis and mindfulness uh, training or concepts put together is hinting towards what acceptance and commitment therapy is all about. Of mm -hmm. course, there's more to it, but we're talking succinctly on a podcast. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, so what, um, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm asking the impossible here, as uh, you know, as you just referenced, we're on a podcast here, not in the graduate level, you know, uh, seminar. Um, but um, keep it, keeping in mind the the uh, the everyday behavior um, analyst practitioner um, who perhaps doesn't have uh, an exposure to acceptance and, and commitment therapy. Um, you know, what are the kind of nuts and bolts of it? Um, you know, I know there are you know several processes involved and whatnot. Um, is it worthwhile going over those? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I have no problem with that. I think it's a good idea. All right. Um, there's a, there's a, a model in acceptance and commitment uh, therapy. Uh, they call it the hexagon model um, mm -hmm. because it is focusing on helping people become more flexible. Sometimes people call it the hexaflex model, silly tongue-in-cheek kind of thing. But there are six points, six, I would say, skills that we teach people. And now that I'm mostly doing safety work and executive coaching, I'm using the hexagon model as a set of skills rather than something that's curative or reducing people's, you know, behavioral diagnoses or anything along those. I'm just, just these six concepts that help people build up a more psychologically flexible repertoire. Now, before I say what those six principles are, I have to explain what psychological flexibility is. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say it in brief. Psychological flexibility gets measured on a test that we would call the AAQ, the Action and Acceptance Questionnaire. It's in its second edition, so it's the AAQ2. And you can find copies of it online for free. Um, just, just Google it. Okay. The higher your scores are in psychological flexibility, the more psychologically flexible you are, the lower your scores are likely to be in measures of psychopathology, okay. like depression and anxiety. And the higher your scores are likely to be, according to the research, in quality of life inventories. Now, you'd have to do the research on your own to really delve deep into the details. But the more psychologically flexible you are, the less likely you are to be diagnosable with some kind of suffering. And the higher likelihood you have for having higher scores on the quality of life inventories that are out there. ACT is designed to have six skills, and they all interact. They all facilitate each other. 
and they help people become more psychologically flexible. If behavior analysts don't like the term psychologically flexible, I throw it right out and I just say flexible or behaviorally flexible. Mm -hmm. Either way, there are six principles. I'll name them, then I'll go into them. All right, cool. J just in brief. One's, just no surprise here, one's called acceptance and acceptance commitment therapy. So we, people have to learn about acceptance, something else that we call diffusion, another thing that we call values, and then there's committed action, and then there's contacting the present moment, and the other one is what we call self as context, but some people prefer to call it perspective taking. Okay. So we'll go through each one of those six. The first one, acceptance. When I'm talking to people about acceptance, I have to make sure that they understand because they understand act definition of that. The term acceptance has lots of different connotations. It's not just like giving up or throwing your hands in the air, right? Exactly. Very good. What we're saying for acceptance is it actively contacting your psychological experiences directly without defending against them while going out and behaving effectively. What we're saying here is if you want to behave effectively at something, something so important to you, you value it, going to one of those other six principles. If you value doing some kind of committed action, Again, another one of those principles. If you value doing some kind of committed action, sometimes you just might not feel like doing it. Or your negative, so to speak, emotions might arise. You might be embarrassed. You might be nervous to do something. You might be too angry to do something. You might be too sad to do something. And then you say to yourself, again, in shorthand, I'm willing to have this feeling right now while doing what I personally care about. Mm -hmm. A pretty typical example is if you're going to give a public presentation, you've got your heart palpitations, you've got your you know, uh, nervousness, you've got your sweats, you've got the sweat dripping down the back of your legs, and you just say, if I don't give this presentation, if I don't have to get up on stage and talk in that microphone, I don't have to feel this bad, this aversive event that I'm having, this emotion is yucky, as long as I don't do it, I don't have to feel this way. And so sometimes people don't do the thing that they care about. But when someone says, no, this is meaningful. I really want to talk about my research. I really want to talk to the local parenting group about autism treatments. And even though I'm really nervous and I've got all these sweats and I'm stammering right now, I'm going to accept that psychological experience mm -hmm. fully without defending against it and go up there and do my presentation. That is somewhat culturally deviant. People usually, when they're having a private event, especially if it's an aversive private event, they're feeling too sad, mad, um, uh, nervous. They sometimes say, no, then that's a signal for me not to do this thing. Uh-uh. If you really care about it, then of course you're going to have some emotions tied into it. And if you really care about it, and you're emotional about it, accept those emotions and go behave effectively anyway. That is culturally deviant. That is a new idea. Mm -hmm. Not brand new idea. I mean, people have been talking about this. You know, Christians have been talking about it. Buddhists have been talking about it for, for centuries. But we don't usually incorporate that into a lot of mental health treatments. We're usually trying to get rid of the emotion, then go do something important. Uh-uh. What we're learning in the 21st century is maybe – trying to get rid of your private events actually that actually is the problem yeah um so if i can put this in kind of layman's terms just to make sure I'm, I'm with you here so it's basically kind of um recognizing your kind of private events um yet persevering with uh and um what you what what you have to do for uh you know in order to obtain perhaps a uh a, a, a yeah, a larger reinforcer down the road, if you will, if we can uh, maybe put some... There you go. You know. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. And the way you just said, you know, a larger reinforcer down the road, in general, we could say what you're talking about are, are values. Yeah. You can do things, and that's another one of the six. What we like to have our clients do is clarify what are the big reinforcers in your life. Not not the next M&M, &M, not the next dollar, mm -hmm. the next 
opportunity to do something of meaning, of worth, of value. Like what's vital in your life? What's purposeful? You, you only get one life on this planet. What are you going to do with it? You right. get to make choices for the most part. I mean, I don't want to get too wrapped up into the beyond freedom and dignity kind of determinism debate, but people do make choices. Choice is very simple. When you have two or, or more th- behaviors at your disposal, you engage in one of them. You've made a choice. Mm-hmm. When people make their choices, what are they making their choices on? Because if they're just making their choice on the next short-term reinforcer, it's not really a m- meaningful life. When yeah. people just say, I'm just going to do the easy thing. I'm going to get the next easy way out of this or you know some kind of uh, I'm going to remove a little bit of pain or I'm going to get a tiny little bit of gain that that's a that's a life of stuckness you're not going anywhere it's when you say I really care about the ultimate reinforcers the big things where I'm going to delay some gratification and work at the things that are more important to me that's living a life of meaning and so what we do with our clients just to bring it back home is we want to ask them what do you want your life to really be about? Mm -hmm. And what kind of committed action steps, measurable behaviors can you engage in to move in that value direction? And that's Mm -hmm. the third of the things that we've been talking about. There's six. The third one for us mentioning right now is committed action. What kinds of measurable things can you do? And can we in therapy or in coaching set up schedules of reinforcement? Can we set up some kind of situation that reinforces people's skills-based behaviors? Um, If I can just jump in here for a second, it seems like I'm just, you know, going off um, what you're saying here. It seems like the committed action and the values piece are, are things that would probably resonate very closely with someone who um, who's a traditionally trained BCBA, who, uh, I, w- I would imagine. Right. I yeah agreed. Um. So anyway, I'm sorry I stopped you. Um, unfortunately, mid thought there. So that's okay. No, uh, I didn't know. Yeah, that's fine. But committed action really is hardcore behavior analysis. You know, I mean, it, I, I say this when I'm talking about it in uh, longer workshops and lectures. It's like the committed action piece, that one-sixth of the hexagon model, committed action piece, that really is behavior therapy. I mean, you know, everything you know about behavior therapy, you fit into acceptance commitment therapy right there at the committed action piece, asking people to engage in certain behaviors, exposure, systematic desensitization, flooding, uh, star charts, behavioral contracts, um, pinpointing or defining operationally what behaviors you would like to see and at what rate, duration, intensity, perseverance, latency. Once you start measuring behavior and operationally defining it, when you do that in the ACT model, it's it's at that wing, that, that committed action piece. So I think the average behavior analyst really would resonate with that one-sixth area. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is once people say, yeah, wow, acceptance commitment therapy really does have a lot, uh, a lot of behavior therapy and you apply behavior analysis in it. I said, yep. And there's five other skills that you can bring into it. Imagine setting someone up on some kind of behavioral contract and also giving them the skills of acceptance. Also giving them the opportunity to clarify what's important and meaningful to them in their values. So the cool thing is acceptance commitment therapy is applied behavior analysis. It is behavior therapy with those added extra five skills, acceptance, diffusion, values, clarification, contacting the present moment and perspective taking. Okay. So we did leave a couple out. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm furiously writing notes here. So (laughs) this is good stuff. Good. Oh, I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, just let me know. I just want to make sure I mention the other two. Contacting the present moment is essentially mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes folks in the 21st century, if they aren't studying mindfulness or never have, sometimes they kind of keep it at arm's length. It sounds like it might be too religious or spiritual. I'm not teaching... Buddhism, when I teach people about mindfulness 
in my work. I want to keep it just secular. I want I want it to be something embraceable by anyone. I'm not telling my clients that they have to get a yin yang tattoo and uh, start wearing yoga pants. You sure. know that's that's not part of the the therapy or the consultation. It's just can you spend a couple of minutes a day focusing on the skill of being right here, right now? You see, your mind or your private verbal repertoire, private verbal events, they're constantly happening. We're so good at using language. We become so fluent at it. It's hard not to think. I mean, it's such a useful skill that we're constantly thinking. But sometimes when you're right in this moment, right here, right now, sometimes you can be thinking about there and then, and you're not paying attention to right here and right now. And why is that bad? Because the only time you can ever engage in any behavior is now. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't behave tomorrow. You can't behave yesterday. You can't behave in five minutes or five minutes ago. You can only behave right now. But your mind or your private verbal events, sometimes they're about yesterday. Sometimes they're about tomorrow. And when you're not thinking about what you're doing, when, you're, when your private verbal events are on something else other than what you're doing, you might miss important cues for action. You might miss important antecedents and maybe even potential consequences because you are so caught up in language. What we want to teach people in acceptance commitment therapy is can you hold it lightly? Can you just notice that you're having thoughts, but try to bring yourself back to this moment as often as you can? Because now is the only time you can behave. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's, yeah, I think uh, I recall um, some examples of that with the uh, with um, eating candy and things like that in your right. in your book, um, yeah. the uh, building safety commitment. Gotcha. Yeah, those are yeah. those are pretty pretty cool examples. Um, um, so that's contact in the present moment. Yep. Um, can you talk about um, diffusion for for a minute? I, I I think we got to it a little bit, but can you talk a little yeah. bit more about that for a sec? Yeah. Yep. They all six of these concepts they really do interact with each other and they're facilitative. So when I was talking about contact in the present moment, I was already talking a little bit about diffusion. You see. The idea here is that you have to know what fusion is before I can talk about defusion. Fusion essentially means that, again, speaking just simply, mm -hmm. it's that your thoughts, your private verbal events or language has a significant impact on how you're feeling and what you're doing. Defusion is being able to just take a look at the fact that you're thinking or that you're experiencing language. Mm -hmm. It's it's harder to do this just on a podcast, but you know what I what I like to do is is, is talk about a lemon. Imagine having a lemon right in front of you. Imagine that lemon is really super ripe. It's almost overripe, and you can smell it. Even though it's just a, about a foot and a half away from you, now that you take this sharp knife that you have around you and you cut this lemon in half, and as soon as you start cutting into it, it sprays out some citric acid and wafts through the air, and you can smell this sour fruit, and you keep slicing it all the way down, and there's a big puddle of lemon juice on your cutting board there, and you can see how, how ripe and sour this fruit is. And you pick up half of that lemon, this dripping half, and the Lemon juice is dripping down between your fingers and down your arm, and you put that lemon up against your lips, and you squeeze that lemon and drink down that sour lemon juice. And then do it again, so this way you can really taste how sour that fresh fruit is. And now, lick the rind with your whole tongue. <laughs> now, I don't know if this is true, but almost anybody who is listening to that, as long as they speak English as a first language, you're probably salivating even just a little bit. Even just a little bit. And when I do these kinds of exercises with folks, most people say, yeah, wow, I was salivating an awful lot. You and probably see thing, a lot of funny looks on people's faces in the crowd when, when, during this exercise. Do you see a lot of puckering? Yes. They wince. They pucker their lips. They kind of squint their eyes like, oh, stop talking about this, <laughs> you know? And this, the, this unbelievable thing is usually when we talk about it and you, your, your podcast listeners can check in with themselves right now. Are there any lemons in the room that you're sitting in? Right? I mean, there's, there's none here. This, yeah, <laughs> right. And there's none here. And I've talked about this particular exercise dozens, if not hundreds of times, and I still salivate. And, and the thing is, that's, 
that's getting close to what we mean by fusion or transformation of stimulus functions. We were just talking, and there was no citric acid being dropped on the receptor sites on your tongue in order to elicit the salivary response. It just didn't happen, but you salivated anyway. That, that's the power of words. Words do have power, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Check this out. What if I were just to do this? And if you know, you're know you listening to this, see if you can just really put yourself into this perspective. All right. Lemon, 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 lemon. Stop it there. If you were to say it along with me, the weird thing is you'd probably get cotton mouth. Sometime in the middle of me doing that, you probably weren't thinking about lemons. You didn't see a yellow fruit. You probably stopped your salivary response. Again, like I was saying, ironically, if you were saying it along with me and you say it for like a whole minute, your mouth dries out. That's weird because when you talk about it in one context, your mouth starts to water. You talk about it by saying it over and over and over and over and over again, and it loses its meaning. It, it doesn't have an impact on you anymore. Mm -hmm. Wait, three minutes ago, we were talking about lemons and you were salivating, even though there was not a lemon in the room. I put it in a different context and just repeat it over and over. And we've got this kind of conditioned habituation happening. You're just right. noticing that it's just a sound. And guess what? It is. All words are just sounds. You don't have to be influenced by them. You don't have to. I mean, you know, this isn't really a podcast exercise, but... I'm raising my right hand. It's way up in the air in my office right here. And I can say to myself, I, I can't raise my right hand. No matter what I do, I can't raise my right hand. And there it is. My hand's way up in the air. If you're listening to this right now, wiggle your toes unless you're driving. Drive safely. But, you know, <laughs> wiggle your toes right now and just repeat to yourself, no matter what I do, I can't wiggle my toes. And notice that behavior and language don't have to be the same thing. It doesn't have to influence you. That's diffusion. I see. And that's what we want to teach some of our leaders or people maybe who are trying to, they come to see me as a psychologist because they're trying to lose weight. Just because you're having the thought, wow, I could really go for a Coca-Cola uh, and I'm going to cook a whole entire tombstone pizza. Notice that you had those verbal events happening between your ears and behind your eyes and go back to your values and say, I really care about my health. I really care about my children's health. I really want to be around a lot longer. So I'm going to go to the committed action steps of eating healthy. I see. Where would self, given that uh, 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 overeating example uh, come in, where would self as context play in, in, in the formulation of that uh, example? What I like to describe when I, when I talk about self as context, I, I like folks to understand that it's just this sense of self that people have. And it's, it is a consistent point of view that, that core you that I would say, if I didn't have to use jargon, just that, that core you that I am period experience. It's, it's, it's hard to just plain old talk about. You almost have to experience it yourself. But it's being able to notice that you have lots of labels and descriptors of yourself. Like, I am six foot three. I am a psychologist. I am a father. I am a New York Giants fan. I could go on and I can give you a hundred descriptors. But there's one true thing about all the ways I describe myself. I am. That I'm a core. That, that I'm... A, alive, that I have this experience from which, this perspective from which I look at everything in my life, whether I'm a psychologist or I'm six foot three or I'm a New York Giants fan, that's content. That's the content of my life. There's a core me. There's a, there's a, a variable, a sense of self from which I experience those things. That's the self as context or your perspective, taking a perspective on your life. This helps people clinically if they're going to believe things about themselves like, I am a loser, I am fat, and I'm never going to lose it. When you have that kind of perspective, that content perspective, sometimes because language is powerful, remember the lemon example, because language is powerful and you're describing yourself a certain way, Sometimes it influences your behavior. But what if you can come to terms with the self as context? Just, you are. 
You just are. Anything that comes after I am blank and you fill it in, that's content. And that can influence people's behavior. What we're trying to get them to do is just experience what it's like to say I am and put a period there. You just are. You're, you're the context of all your experiences, all your emotions, sensations, thoughts, verbal descriptions, um, urges, uh, flashbacks, memories. You have them. You are not those things. You just have them. You're the okay. context for your emotions and feelings and sensations and urges and thoughts. Kind of like a vessel. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Can well, you have it? Yeah. Can you have it and realize it's not you? Can you have a bad feeling and realize it's not you? Can you have a you know word description, I'm no good, and realize it's not you? You're just having it. Mm-hmm. Wow. So we try to pull all those things together, all six of them. Acceptance, diffusion, values, committed action, contacting the present moment, and having better perspective taking. Um, we pull them all together, and it leads to greater psychological flexibility, or at least we hope. I see. Wow. That's uh, uh, w- well done. I think you covered the, uh, the, the six concepts pretty, uh, pr- pretty, pretty more, more quickly than I think uh, we both imagined. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully it was understandable. No, no. I thought, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think, uh, it is. Um, I, I, and I don't want to hold you too much longer, but um, it, would it be possible for you to spend a few minutes? And, and I know you've um, uh, done some um, speaking on how this um, model is related to behavior analysis practice, um, with parents, etc. Uh, do you have a couple of minutes to, to talk about uh, that? Sure. Happily. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, so if you can tell us, uh, you know, what would be... Uh, I think in one of our conversations, you're talking about using the ACT model uh, to um, motivate parents and staff members to, um, you know, follow through with complex treatment plans and things like that. Can, um, so yeah. can you can you describe that in a little bit more detail? Yeah, I'll be happy to. The um, book chapter uh, that I co-wrote with uh, J.T. Blackledge and Thane Dykstra. It came out in 2009 in a book called Teaching Children with Autism in the General Education Classroom. That's the name of the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wrote a chapter called An Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Approach um, to Supporting Parents of Children Diagnosed with Autism. Mm -hmm. When I was going through graduate school, try to keep this as succinctly as I can. And Rich O'Brien and Kurt Salzinger were influencing me to become well-read in behavior analysis. I also wanted to become well-practiced in behavior analysis. So I actually joined up with the Rutgers University Lovas Replication Program and was doing a lot of early traditional treatment of autism using behavior analysis. But there was a part of me that said, this isn't the only thing that I went into behavior analysis for. And I was looking at the parents and I could see that the parents were upset. I could see that there was a lot of stress. I could see that there was a lot of marital distress. And I was also noticing that some parents were handling it better than others. And the ones who weren't handling it very well didn't do a great job with the behavior analysis work that we were doing together. We're supposed to be doing 40 hours of uh, ABA work and the more distressed parents weren't doing it. And I said, I wonder if this stuff that I'm reading about, acceptance commitment therapy, could help the parents accept the stress of having a child diagnosed with autism and commit to following through on their 40 hour behavior analysis program with their child. Mm -hmm. And, All I have was anecdotal uh, uh, evidence, if you will, just anecdotal stories that it seemed like parents who were willing to learn mindfulness, willing to clarify their values, were more in tune with what they had to do in order to be a good parent to this child with autism. And JT Blackledge did his dissertation on helping out parents with children with autism. I can't remember the results. I'm not good at citing chapter and verse, but I think he had very positive results. We want to help out parents who have children diagnosed with autism with the ACT model. Okay, so I could see, you know, clarifying the values and the committed action piece certainly would... um perhaps um, attenuate some of the um, 
uh, avoidance as a reinforcer, if you will. You know, in other words, if they are about to engage in a in a, um, a teaching routine that you know sometimes is successful and sometimes it isn't, you know, the the um, uh, escaping that would be very reinforcing. Uh, right. Uh, and and so recognizing right. that they're having the experience, I guess, of not wanting to do it, and then you know, persevering despite that, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, and identifying, you know, the, the, the longer term reinforcer as their values, uh, yep. is, is that my, yes. kind of on the right track here? I was just going to say, you're hitting the nail right on the head that All right. you're speaking about it in the way that, uh, that seems that you understand where we're going with this. Yes. I, I have some friends who are delayed discounting researchers and so they, they would love the, yeah. the, the, the values and, and, and piece as well. So in terms yeah, of, I don't know. I don't know a ton about it, but I keep thinking that, you know, when I, when I do see the posters at a local state conference about delayed discounting, I go, wow, you know, I mean, we really need the delayed discounting work to make sure it's, it's linked up with what's going on with relational frame theory and, and what we know about the behavior analysis of language. Because, you know, I imagine that something becomes worth less or more, depending upon the language you use to describe it. Um, and, and, and I think we can mess with or alter people's interaction with their own language. So that would have an influence on the delayed discounting measures. It'd be interesting to see somebody start to investigate that. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, well, well, this has been a really uh, um, enlightening and thought-provoking kind of uh, overview of ACT. And again, I appreciate your time. I don't want to hold you too much longer. So um, do you have, uh, is there anything else we missed? Um, or is, do you, I mean, I, th I think we kind of covered quite a bit of ground here. And I think if anybody was really interested in learning more about acceptance commitment therapy or relational frame theory, you would want to check out contextualscience.org. Mm -hmm. Just well, all one word, contextualscience.org. Or the organization is... Um, it's called the Association for Contextual Behavioral Sciences. And when you go to that particular website, consider becoming a member of the ACBS. And the, the neat thing is, you know, you get access to just dozens, if not hundreds of PowerPoints, podcasts, questionnaires, um, and PDFs to almost all the articles about acceptance commitment therapy and, and uh, relational frame theory. There's over 100 randomized control trials showing acceptance commitment therapy to be a worthy approach. Mm -hmm. And having access to being able to read those PDFs, I think it would be great for, for any, any person interested in clinical behavior analysis or complex behavior analysis. So the, the neat thing is that we're a values-based organization, so it's values-based dues. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the APA and ABAI, they tell you how much you should pay in order to become a member. At ACBS, we say, what do you think it's worth? We hope people actually do values-based dues, and we go, wow, you know, I get, a lot, I get a lot out of this organization, so I'm willing to pay for it. But it's values-based dues, so check out, the, uh, check out the URL, just check out that website, and I'm sure you'll find something there that will immediately – uh, catch your fancy. So I would yeah. I would check out ACBS. Well, I, I'll echo I'll echo those sentiments because I uh, um, I have joined and uh, that that values based dues is is definitely something um, I've never seen before. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's d definitely different. But uh, it'd be interesting to see the data on on what what uh, you know uh, the 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 variation, but on um, you know the. the what, How much people pay? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but that, right, that's right. a podcast for a different day. I, I, yeah, I, right, I, I right. gather. So, uh, anywho, um, this has been, like I said, a, a really uh, um, thought provoking, delightful conversation. So, uh, uh, DJ Moran, I want to thank you again for your time. Matt, I'm happy to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, if you ever have any other questions, feel free to contact me. All right. Thanks so much. Take care now. Bye. Hey, everybody. I'm back. And boy, what a great job DJ did in describing ACT in such a uh, succinct way, you know, summarizing uh, research and practice that's been going on for a couple of decades into about, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes of conversation or so. Um, 
so much to cover. Uh, I don't even know where to begin. I, what I want to do is definitely take DJ up on his offer to come back on the podcast. I would love to hear more about how he uses ACT for the fostering of behavioral safety and leadership and things like that. Finally, I want to echo DJ's recommendation to, uh, for those who are interested in learning more about ACT, to check out contextualscience.org. That is the uh, flagship website for the Association for Contextual Behavioral Sciences. Um, again, uh, contextualscience.org. Uh, consider joining. That gives you access to a treasure trove of information. And I uh, know from uh, personal experience, um, having uh, re-upped my membership a couple of times, I've found that uh, invaluable. So anyhow, um, that's all I have today. Uh, if you uh, enjoyed the episode uh, and have a couple of minutes, just uh, head on over to iTunes and give a rating and review. That really helps us uh, kind of stand out from all the other podcasts that are out there. Uh, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. And I will... Uh, See you guys later. Thanks for listening. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>